All right, guys. Good evening. We'll just wait a short 60 seconds here before we get going. Uh, but I just wanted to say I'm super excited to do this again. I have was a little bit on the fence about doing these live events, but they've been a really cool opportunity to explore topics in like a, a lot more depth, which I normally don't do in my videos. I try to be super concise and just cover the, the major points, but this has been really fun. So we'll just give some folks some time here to, uh, to log on. Be sure and hit me up with any questions over there on the right-hand side in the, in the chat or left-hand side, depending on how you have it rigged. Uh, and I'll try and get to as many of those questions as I can as I move along. And towards the end, I usually reserve some time. So if anybody has any issues with audio or anything, just let me know in the chat section. And uh, I'll try to address it here on my end. But uh, I can turn up my microphone or anything if you guys have any issues. Anybody been out fishing or mostly just huddled in due to uh, snow and rain and wind? It's been a pretty brutal uh, last month, I guess. This winter just seems to keep on going and does not want to let go. But I'm looking forward to getting out there uh, chasing kokanee as soon as uh, those lows creep out of the low 20s and teens. Okay, so we are going to get started. Uh, this topic is one I've been wanting to do for a long time. And we're going to be talking about kokanee and color, right? Like this is something everybody asks on the water, what color are you using? And there are a lot of colors that we use for kokanee, but um, maybe not necessarily the best colors. And we're going to explore some of that today. So. What we're really going to talk about today is this convergence of kokanee vision and physiology and the physics of light in water and how those two interact and what does that mean to kokanee anglers in terms of what we should be using, at what depths, at what time of day, and try and tie all this together. There's, there's a lot of moving pieces here, but I think it's pretty fun and interesting because the science has really moved forward on a lot of this stuff. So we're going to go all the way back to high school physics class. <laughs> and uh, we're going to talk about the electromagnetic spectrum. And that is um, what light is. Visible light is a part of that uh, electromagnetic spectrum. It's a really teeny tiny part of it, right? So humans really only see a narrow part of this spectrum, whereas fish see a slightly wider part of the spectrum. And the main thing I want you to take away from this graphic is that as wavelengths on the electromagnetic spectrum get longer in the visible spectrum, they skew towards red and the shorter wavelengths are purple. And then, of course, if you go beyond purple, you get into the ultraviolet. And if you go beyond red, you get into the infrared, which humans can't see, but fish can. So let's compare the vision capabilities, what we know about salmon. Um, there's not a lot of scientific literature that looks specifically at sockeye or kokanee. But there's a lot of research looking at salmon. And so I wanted to compare it between humans and salmon here. And so what you see is that humans can see anywhere from 350 nanometers up to 780 nanometers. So we're in that purple to red spectrum, whereas salmon can actually see a little bit beyond into the infrared, just a little bit, and they can see into the ultraviolet um, fairly well. And they do this using the same structures in their eyes as we do. So uh, salmon and human eyes are very similar in their light detection um, or electromagnetic spectrum detection. By using two structures, that's going to be cones, which are best at detecting color in really bright conditions. Um, and then they have rods, which uh, are really more for grayscale vision. So if you see off to the, on the side of the slide there, you can see these two different structures, and there's an electro scan microscope 
image of, of rods and cones adjacent to each other. They look very similar between humans and fish. Now, rods really just function to detect light versus dark. They're not designed to detect color, uh, and they're not very useful in bright conditions. And so uh, what happens in salmon is they actually retract those rods deeper into the eye during daytime hours uh, so that the information coming in from their eye isn't blown out by all this information from the rods and it actually helps to expose the color cones a little bit more so that they get better color detection and they do vice versa at night the rods become more exposed and, and uh, makes them more sensitive to light uh, humans, we don't have the ability to retract our rods. We actually flood rods with melanin during uh, bright conditions so that the signal is being interrupted and we're not getting a bunch of just light, bright information. We really want to get that color detail. Uh, so this gives salmon a little bit of an edge in terms of low light uh, conditions, which makes sense. Um, they do feed in darker environments and they're more crepuscular, so active in those transition periods in the morning and evening. Um, humans aren't really that active during that period. We're more of a diurnal animal. Now, one of the things that's interesting about, um, you know, humans versus salmon in terms of color vision and cones is that humans actually have three color cones and salmon have four. So if we were to break this down uh, between the two, we have human versus salmon color vision. Sorry, my little video there is covering up the vision word there. But you'll see in humans, we have three cones that give us three distinct uh, color peaks. Uh, we have one color peak at 445 nanometers, which coincides with blue, 540 nanometers, which gives us our green vision, and 565, which gives us red. And if you look over at salmon, they have a very analogous cone structure. They have a 445 for blue peak, they have a 565 for red, but their green is a little bit skewed towards the blue at 500 and 508 nanometers. And then they've got that weird other peak down there you see at 370 nanometers. That is the ultraviolet. So we know from uh, studies in the lab that salmonids, especially juvenile salmonids, have very good ultraviolet vision, which helps uh, to detect the zooplankton that they feed on. Like Daphnia, Daphnia have a very strong ultraviolet reflectance. And those juvenile salmon are using those cones, those ultraviolet cones, to detect their food. Uh, unfortunately, every bit of literature I've seen shows that as these juvenile salmon mature or salmonids mature, uh, they lose this ability to use those ultraviolet cones, they degrade. And although I've never seen, uh, I haven't seen any papers specifically looking at sockeye, because I'd be really curious, because sockeye maintain their diet of zooplankton throughout their life, it would make me think that it would be a huge advantage to maintain use of those cones. But for now, I think it's pretty safe to assume that Kokanee cannot see, at least the kokanee that we're targeting, the third, fourth year fish, cannot see into the ultraviolet. So when it comes down to it, um, they have very similar color cone uh, detection that we do. So this is a little bit helpful in, help, in helping us understand what uh, kokanee see underwater, except it's not just that simple. It's not just uh, what do their cones detect. There's a lot of other variables at play here. And specifically, I want to talk about color sensitivity. And when I refer to sensitivity, I'm talking about what is the their peak ability to differentiate shades of different colors. And for humans, uh, which is this is the photopic vision graph for humans, their humans have peak color sensitivity uh, in the green, green, yellow. So we're really good at detecting different shades of green and green, yellow um, more than any other color. Okay, And we're really bad at detecting shades of blue. Like it really drops off. Like that's probably one of the worst things we're at, <laughs> doing at is detecting shades of blue. Whereas fish 
in general uh, have extreme sensitivity in the blue range, which makes sense. Their environment is rich in blue, and I'm going to cover some more of that later on. This is followed by red, which is 10 times less sensitive than their blue. And, but this is really highly variable by species. And so if you look up around my talking head up there, you're going to see a bunch of weird little color patterns and different species names like goldfish, perch, stickleback, etc. Those are actually the cone, color cone mosaics within the eyes of different fish species. You'll notice that some species really lack cones for certain colors altogether. They're not really utilizing them. So for perch, it's primarily red. Red is their dominant cone. They have some green. Uh, sticklebacks have more of a diversity of colors. So each species is really, their eyes are, have evolved in a way to maximize uh, their survivability in the habitat that they're living in and the lifestyles that they live. So if we look down below, we see Pacific Salmon's uh, cone mosaic is very complex, um, which is very typical for species that are uh, highly reliant on vision. But we see that they have these uh, individual blue cones. There's 13 blue cones in a Pacific Salmon uh, cone mosaic. And then there's paired, 12 paired red and green cones. And so what we see here with those isolated blue cones is that's going to give them higher sensitivity in the blue. And then they also get 13 cones versus uh, 12 of the other ones. So they're really going to peak in that blue and then probably followed by red. So what does this mean for kokanee? Uh, well, it means that kokanee do see color different than we do and that they can detect greater variations of shades of blue. They don't have a good ability to detect variations in shades of green and yellow. So, you know, changing up your green lure probably isn't going to have a huge impact on how many fish you catch, but changing up your variations in your blues or reds might. Another thing is, is because kokanee see deeper into the red, uh, a dark red to them, or dark red to us, will look much brighter to them. So when you pick up a dark red lure, you're thinking, well, that doesn't look very bright. It's actually going to be much brighter to a kokanee than it is to you, because our red falls off much quicker than a kokanee's red. And then kokanee are also going to have a better low light vision than we will. But kokanee are like us in that they can't see UV uh, past their juvenile life stages and color doesn't matter to them in low light like it doesn't matter to us because they are bound by the same physiological constraints of rods and cones. So I see a comment, boom, already. I knew this was coming. Mega says, wait, they can't see UV. I've bought so many UV hoochies for them over the years. Well, that's because the manufacturers are not using the right word, and we're going to get into that into a little bit. So there is a problem, right? And uh, I want to get into that problem next. But before I do, I just want to say uh, I've been so grateful uh, that this channel and the success of it this past year has been made possible by you, uh, especially to all of the folks giving in the super chat. Um, so you can donate um, in the chat there, or if you're watching this after it's uploaded, you can hit that super thanks. Those donations are making a huge difference in letting me keep this channel going without using sponsorships, which is something I'm trying to move away from. So I really appreciate that. And if you want to join my community, you can hit that join button, or you can go to Patreon, which is in the links in the description below. Um, I'm going to be releasing in a few weeks uh, the preliminary list of the lakes. I'm going to do some meetups with my community members and Patreon members. So I would love to meet some of you um, out on the water. That would be really fun. Okay, so the major problem with talking about color and kokanee and human vision up to this point is that humans live in air, kokanee live in water. <laughs> These are very different uh, environments to live in terms of uh, talking about the electromagnetic spectrum, right? Uh, for one, uh, light does not transmit well in water. So 
you lose about 50% of light in the top 30 foot of the water column due to absorption, reflectance, and scattering of light. Uh, so water eats light. I mean, there's no other way to put it. And how the electromagnetic spectrum uh, penetrates into water uh, varies depending on uh, the wavelength and depth. So one of the things that uh, you should note out of this is that red photons, out of all of them, diminish the most quickly. And so you will lose all red light beyond 30 feet. It's, there's no more red photons available, no more red light. Um, colors like blues and purples and UV actually penetrate extremely well. Uh, in really clear water, they can get upwards of 90 to 100 plus feet. Uh, but they do scatter widely, so it's not like it, it doesn't, it, it still gets broken up as it's going down there, and it gets darker as you go deeper. So this explains why fish are mostly sensitive to blue. This makes sense, right? Because if you look at the water column, most of their environment is rich in blue light, and only a small section of their environment that is up near the surface has all these other colors available to see. Which explains also why a lot of like deep sea fish are, are red, right? So if you think about a lot of our rockfish, like canary rockfish and, and vermilion rockfish off our coast that live deep, or you go to the Gulf, you're going to get all these dark red fish that are hanging out, you know, a couple hundred feet down. And that's because there's just simply no red light available there for them. There's no red light that reflects off of them. They are essentially in stealth mode because there's no light that reflects off of red. There's no red available. They just look like their surrounding environment. They just in stealth mode, they just disappear. But I think that one of the things a lot of kokanee anglers forget is that these rules apply horizontally as well. So uh, when we think about uh, the physics of light and water, I think a lot of times we just think about it in the up and down vertical water column. But you have to remember that 30 feet is 30 feet in water. It doesn't matter if you're horizontal or vertical. And so a kokanee that's 30 feet away from a pink and red hoochie dodger setup is going to it's not going to look pink or red it can't physically look pink there's no red or pink photons available and uh so what they're responding to there is really the flash off of your dodger your lure is just going to look gray or black to them not pink or red they just can't see it there's not in this universe they cannot see that the laws of physics prohibit them from being able to as they move closer they're going to start picking up those colors those of pink and red so if they're within 15 feet then color might play a role but at 30 feet it can't if it's red or pink and one of the ways i tested this was last year i or a couple years ago i i went out and i took a couple dodgers i painted one jet black and then i had the other one just chrome and i was fishing deep near the thermocline around 35 40 feet and all of my fish came on the chrome dodger <laughs> like, so even though those dodgers and stuff were running right side by side that chrome dodger was drawing in the fish and they were committed to that one with the flash the so flash clearly was m way more critical than color because they both have the identical color lure um, that were and they were the same dodger so they're creating the same action but the one with the flash was getting all the fish so not only was it, it probably the one responsible for drawing the fish in but it was also the one that was getting bit uh, so that's really interesting to me it shows just how important flash is at attracting fish from a distance but also exciting them to bite when they're close and so I apply this, this chart, like this chart I've used a hundred friggin' times in every video I've made about talking about color. And that is, you know, when I'm fishing near the surface where there's red light, yellow light, green, blue, all these colors, I'm going to focus on those colors, those really productive kokanee colors, like pinks and oranges uh, and reds. So I'm going to run a setup like this. And then when I move out deeper, I'm going to use uh, colors that, uh, like if I'm fishing at 50 to 75 feet, I'm going to use those colors that I know are available deeper, like yellows, chartreuse, uh, purple, blue. And so you know, this is how I'm using that chart to help drive my decision making uh, about the gear I'm going to use.
but wait, <laughs> there's a bit of an issue here because this past year, out of curiosity, I put a bunch of my favorite kokanee hoochies um, 50 feet down and I put a camera on them. So I had black, pink, purple, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. Okay, this is at 50 feet deep. There should not be hardly any red light available at that depth. Now, granted, the camera that I'm using is probably more sensitive than the human eye, but a couple things jump out immediately. One is that the red on the far right is pretty dim and grayish looking. It's not really bright red anymore, even though that is a bright red hoochie. But the orange and the pink are insanely bright compared to everything else. What is going on here? Why, how is this, how is this possible to have uh, pink and orange be so bright at these depths? At 50 feet deep, uh, this is actually closer to 55, there shouldn't be any uh, light available to reflect those colors, or it should be really diminished. And so this led me uh, down this rabbit hole, which Megas brought up, which is we need to talk about fluorescence and fluorescent lures. And so manufacturers have used the term UV lures for a long time, but they're actually not using the right terminology here. Okay. Uh, a, a UV reflectance lure would be really hard to sell to a human being because we can't see into the UV. <laughs> so like if it has UV reflectance, great, it's possible, but uh, we A would not be able to see it and the fish wouldn't be able to see it either because no fish nor humans have UV capabilities as adults. So what they're really talking about here is fluorescent lures. And so here's a picture of those same hoochies in the same order uh, under a black light. And you'll see that the pink and orange stand out the most out of all of these. And so what is fluorescence? Well, fluorescence is this really cool uh, attribute of the pigments that they're using in making these lures or paints. And what fluorescence does is it's a two-stage process where uh, a pigment or paint absorbs light, at especially shortwave light, and re-emits it at a longer wavelength. So what happens is, uh, you know, a lure, a pink lure down at depth uh, is absorbing some of this red and white light and purples and blues at, at these shorter wavelengths, and then it's re-emitting them at a much longer wavelength, which makes it look brighter and it actually gives off pink light. And this is how you get lures that are pink, red, or orange to look pink, red, or orange at depths beyond which that light exists. So this is the importance of fluorescence. And I wanna kind of show you this little graphic here. So we've got our kokanee fishermen up there on the top. If you're fishing shallow and you have two identical setups that are both pink with pink lures, pink dodger, if they're, one's fluorescent and, they're, and the other's non-fluorescent, you're probably not gonna notice much of a difference if they're running near the surface. They're gonna look the same because there's uh, plenty of red light available, red and pink light available near the surface. But if you drop those two same setups to depth, then you go down deep say 50, 60 feet, the fluorescent one's still gonna look pink. Maybe it might be a little more subdued, but it's still gonna look very pink, very bright. Whereas the non-fluorescent is just gonna look gray uh, because there's no red light to reflect off of it. So this is where it's important to run that. So basically what's happening is those, those lures uh, that are down there at depth, those pink fluorescent lures and dodgers, uh, are taking the ultraviolet light and the purple and blue light and re-emitting it in a pink wavelength. And that is giving them their pink coloration. Whereas the other one's relying purely on reflectance and there's no red light to reflect. So they will just look gray or black. So why do manufacturers call it UV? Well, they call it UV because it's common to use a UV black light to demonstrate Allure's fluorescent property, like I did uh, you know, back here on this slide, 
this is under a black light. And you can clearly tell which lures have fluorescent capabilities. And I'm doing that using a UV black light. And I think this is where the terminology comes in, is they're using the incorrect term. What they're trying to say is their lures are fluorescent. And they're using a black UV light to demonstrate fluorescence. So what is neat about fluorescence, especially in using a UV black light, why it makes why it's so captivating to human beings is that we can't, when you have a UV black light, um, most of the light coming out of that, that flashlight or light isn't visible to us because it's beyond our spectrum. But when that light hits a fluorescent lure, it's converting that UV light into a longer wavelength light that we can see. So it makes the lure appear exceptionally bright to us. Uh, and then of course that is a great selling point and it's a great way to illustrate it. They're just using the wrong terminology. So when I got to thinking about this, well, why do looking at all of that and our understanding of the importance of fluorescence and uh, the physiology of kokanee vision, why does it, why do kokanee like or seem to prefer red, orange, or pink? Well, there's two possibilities, and one which is the most probable is that it's an evolutionary and dietary specialization result. And that is, a lot of what kokanee eat, uh, so bloodworms, amphipods, copepods, mice, and shrimp, are pink, orange, red, right? They're in that range. And so it, may, it makes sense if you're a kokanee swimming around, if you could spot concentrations of these food resources and target them. But there's another possibility here of that maybe they don't actually prefer red, orange, and pink. Um, maybe kokanee anglers aren't exploiting kokanee's higher sensitivity to blue, um, in part because humans really suck at seeing different shades of blue. Um, additionally, uh, you really won't see that many uh, kokanee or blue kokanee lures. Like we, we seem to have got hung up on pinks, oranges, and, and reds. Uh, and I just don't see blue a lot. Uh, and another thing that I've really noticed, because I've taken my black light into tackle shops and stuff, and almost none of the blue kokanee lures have any fluorescence, whereas almost all of the red, orange, and pinks do. So we might, we might be, uh, tricking ourselves into this belief that red, orange, and pinks are the, are the go-to lure for kokanee. I mean, no doubt, I'm confident in them, but it makes me wonder, are we missing out on something potentially important here with the blues? Uh, the Troutman85 asks, does this work on trout? A lot of what I'm saying applies to trout as well, because semonids and trout are all really closely related. Uh, so yeah, I'm really curious about exploring blue more or purple for kokanee because there's not that great a diversity of lures or dodgers out there that actually have fluorescence in those colors so what does this mean to you like so let's take all this information that i i just laid out to you and how can this make you a better cooking angler and i think uh, i think there's just a couple things i want to drive home one is that when fishing shallow less than 30 feet i don't think fluorescence is going to matter that much i think you know unless it's low light conditions which might uh, a fluorescent lure might look a little bit brighter to because it's taken some of that uh, preliminary uv light and converting it into visible light uh, i think you're not going to see a huge difference in a lure productivity um, a non-fluorescent versus fluorescent shallow however when you're fishing deep that's greater than 30 feet deep um, if you're using pink, orange, or red, then uh, you definitely want to have fluorescence as part of that uh, lure's pigment or paint, uh, depending on what it is. And you really should be considering incorporating blues or purples into your uh, lure uh, color complex when you're fishing at those depths. I think this is why if I had to like pick a like survival hoochie like the one hoochie that catches more kokanee than any for me it would be the micro hoochie that's pink purple um it's a pink fluorescence with that purple back that thing works for me everywhere at depth 
and no wonder right because it's got that pink uh, fluorescence at depth and it has that purple which is an abundant light resource at depth that thing has just got to look like uh, an absolute delicious Snickers bar down there at depth. I mean, it's really got to glow to those kokanee. It really got to stand out to them because they're already sensitive in that blue purple zone. And then you've got that little bit of pink in there too. So in low light, uh, dawn and dusk, I don't think uh, color is going to matter that much because kokanee eyes are a lot like ours. They struggle with that color. And uh, I think more importantly, you're going to want to get things with glow, uh, either white um, or metallic lures. So metallic lures are great because they reflect all available light and that's contrast and rods in their eyes detect that very well. But what I really want to do is to develop, uh, I, I really want to challenge if any kokanee tackle manufacturers are watching this video, I'd really challenge them to step up and uh, give us give us some blue and purple lures with a fluorescence. It's maybe, maybe those pigments are hard to come by and, and expensive, I don't know, but I just don't see them and I wanna see more of them. And I wanna try them myself. <laughs> I'm gonna answer some questions here uh, real quick, but uh, this is the end of this talk. It's a really interesting topic. And there's, like I said, there's still some unknowns. Um, like I really interested if, if kokanee or sockeye in, in general actually maintain some UV vision later into their lives. I found some really cool papers that showed that a, adult salmon, especially Chinook, actually as they move back into fresh water, their infrared vision improves uh, after being in the ocean, which is really intriguing to think about the possibilities there, um, that they're relying on infrared more uh, than they normally would. So Evergreen United asks, is there a difference between the function of glow and the function of fluorescence? Absolutely. So glow is going to produce light. If you charge a glow lure and you drop it down there in the pitch black, it will glow in the pitch black, whereas a fluorescent lure in pitch black will just be pitch black because a fluorescent lure needs other light in order to convert that light into a different form. So it, it has to have incoming light all the time. If you turn the light switch off on a fluorescent lure, it doesn't glow, whereas a glow lure does. Uh, so Linda asks basically the same thing. Do we need to charge our lures before we deploy? Only if it's a glow lure. So don't, don't mistake glow with fluorescence. They're two very different things. There is a third type of glow. With, so glow is phosphorescence, right? That is, uh, it is storing up light energy and releasing it after the fact. Whereas fluorescence can only instantly convert that light energy from a short wave to a longer wave. Let's see, Mega says silver and blue slay all year at his lake. Um, Spencer says that Yamashita has a purple haze, which is purple blue fluorescence. So that's interesting. And it looks like several other people are having pretty good luck uh, with blue and reds. Chris Nation asks, uh, does using a hoochie with UV properties, does trolling with the sun or against the sun matter? So I think that um, there's definitely a pattern about trolling with or against the sun um, in terms of kokanee success. I'm not sure how much it relates directly to fluorescence. Uh, you know, when light enters water, it scatters a lot and it absorbs pretty quickly too. Um, so I oftentimes I think it has a lot more to do with how much flash you're getting off your dodger more than it has to do with uh, color on the lure, but that's just my hypothesis. Let's see. Yeah, so Greg Wilkinson says Brad's killer fish as a blue and silver kokanee cut plug. Yet uh, late season, one of my most productive lures at, at Merwin was the Seahawk mini cut plug. That thing would outfish. It was huge, right? Because they didn't make the kokanee cut plugs back back in back in my day, <laughs> back ten years ago. Um, they didn't make a mini. Uh, Seahawk cut plug. So 
or a Kokanee one. So I was using the minis, um, which you use for like Chinook, and uh, I caught a lot of really nice Kokanee on that. Um, and it would outfish most of those lures on many days, especially late season. Spencer asks, do I think any of these tips will work with sockeye and the salt? Uh, I'm trying to figure out the fishery up in Marine Area 7. Um, you know, I'm not, I, I think that this applies to all species of salmon. So all of this data, all these papers, I had like 16 papers I had to read and break down to figure out this information. Almost all of them were looking at either rainbow trout, chinook, coho, uh, salmon. So I think it, I think it's pretty safe to say, given the tight evolutionary relationship of all these fish, that it's probably um, it applies similarly to all these different species. Uh, let's see, the Troutman eighty five asks, how fast would I troll for kokanee if the water temp is below fifty compared to spring when temps are in the sixties? I don't really vary my speeds up that much, so. Um, you know, in warmer conditions, I might hit 1.5, 1.7, and really cold, maybe 1.2, 1.3. But there's definitely been winter days out on Lake Roosevelt where the surface temperature is 36 degrees, and I'm hitting them at 1.5. So you just got to make those turns and uh, see what the fish are telling you. If you're catching fish on the outside rod in a turn, then they're probably wanting faster. If it's on the inside rod, they're probably wanting slower. Kokini Cowboy asks, where is moon jelly on the color spectrum? So moon jelly is, is, is not really a color, right? It's a, it's a type of reflectance tape. Uh, so it's, uh, it's scattering light. Um, and I think it, one of the things I want to separate, like, like tape, like moon jelly. Uh, um, I mean, I, I love moon jelly so much, I'd probably put it all over my car if I could find a way to do it cheaply, but is you know, metal reflects light, whereas the moon jelly tape is actually scattering and, and shattering and breaking light into a different, uh, it's different spectrum. And that's what gives it that unique, like oil sheen color. And depending on how you look at it, you get a different color. So really what it's doing is it's taking white light and breaking it like a prism into many different uh, colors. And I think that's part of the interesting effect of it is that if there's a color that Kokanee are excited by, we assume it to be pink, reds, and oranges, maybe it's blue, uh, you're probably going to get some of that reflectance isolated out of moon jelly tape. Uh, so let's see. Hungry Dad asks, do you feel that highland or lowland reservoirs make a difference in the effects of spotted bass? I'm not really qualified to answer that. Uh, Brian Johns, so does a black light test for fluorescence? Yes. So I actually have a little black light. I carry around with me and um, I take this into tackle shops with me all the time um, when I'm going to test out new products, whether it be for kokanee or other species, trout. Uh, because if I want my lure to have fluorescence, then I need this black light to test it. And a lot of times uh, I've even found some companies will say, oh, UV on their lure and then I test it and it's not there, right? Um, so don't always believe what's on the package, carry a little tiny black light with you. Uh, Gutter asks about how was my trip to Thailand? It was amazing. Um, I had, a, the trip is more focused on enjoying Thailand's uh, food and um, bird watching, but we had a few fishing trips in there. Uh, and a major part of this trip was to tick off a species off my bucket list, uh, which was not the Mekong catfish, but was another one, and that video is coming next week. Okay, well, I think uh, I'm at the end of the questions here. I really appreciate everybody's support in this. Um, I hope you enjoy uh, tonight's topic. It's an interesting one and a fun one that I hope to revisit in the future as I am able to get my hands on some blue and purple fluorescent lures and put them to the test uh, down at depth. All right, guys, have a good night. And just remember, fish smarter, not harder. Bye, guys.